So last time we stopped speaking uh, <coughs> about usability testing uh, here. Mm? We went through the main idea, the main concept behind the informed consent form that is again a form that is mandatory for all user-facing studies including usability testing in which you inform uh, the participants about what is going to happen in the, in the, in the test and they are not only you inform them, but they, uh, they know, they are informed and give an informed consent to, um, to proceed with the text. And, and this is something that you have to prepare. <coughs> it's something quite standard. As you can imagine, more or less the things to say are always the same with slightly difference according to uh, the specifics of the <coughs> usability testing. Mm -hmm. Clearly, if you are experimenting um, a medical uh, application, a medical system in an hospital is very different than a mobile application for playing football. Mm -hmm. Also, according to uh, informed consent. Mm -hmm. The kind of information, the kind of peril, the dangers that each of these two kinds of application may pose to the participants are different. So after the, the consent form, uh, you have to decide, we said, um, so just as a recap, you have to decide who is your target population for the uh, testing, um, how many of them you, you need, you have to prepare a bunch of material including the consent form, and most importantly, you need to prepare a series of tasks mm, with their success and not success criteria and other metrics that you want to, other data that you want to collect than to analyze in this planning phase of the usability testing. And uh, which metrics can you use or which metrics in general can, are used? So metrics are mainly for understanding if a task was successful or not and for getting any other additional information that you may want. And typically metrics are of two kinds. There are subjective metrics, typically question that you ask participant for, like prior to the session, background information. We said the last time maybe the age or the level of education or the familiarity with a specific action or specific task that your application, your system is uh, supporting the user to do. Or question about the task, each task. So after each task or each group of tasks is completed, you can ask how his was this task to be completed or how satisfactory was it? So subjective metrics, things that you cannot measure it in a quantitative way that stem from subjective perception. How, how easy do you find that? It's something that each person can answer slightly different probably. And for, to make another example, at the end of the session, you can also ask the overall ease of use of the entire application and system that participant experiment with many tasks, uh, as well as satisfaction, or for instance, the likelihood uh, to use or recommend the, to use the same system for, to another person. Hmm? These are all kind of subjective metrics. Then we have qu quantitative metrics. So what you are going to measure in your test, like the completion rate, how many tasks were successfully completed, nine out of 10. This is not something subjective. This is something that you have criteria in place and you can say, yes, this task was completed, this task was not. 
So overall, you can say for, for each participant and for all your participants, which is your success completion rate. Or the error rate. How many errors the participants did? And that, those could be per task. So overall, all the participants make 50% or 50% of errors on task A, on task number three. Hmm? Or task number three got the double the errors than all the other tasks. Hmm? So errors. Again, this could be per task, this could be per participant. Hmm? So participant number one had the higher rate of error than all the other participants. MAB participant number one was a specific part of your target population. So also this information can tell you something about the, the task or the usability overall. Also, time of task. How much time the user spent, or the participants spent on a specific task. Again, overall, all the participants on a specific task or per, uh, or per participants. Participant number one, uh, spent overall hmm, on average one minute per task, while participant number two spent overall three minutes per task. Hmm. These are examples of quantitative metrics that can be used. Some of them are really, really frequent, like the successful completion rate or the error rate. Uh, time on task could be used in some cases make less sense in other cases, uh, maybe when you have a, ta a time sensitive task or when time is a criteria for success, maybe the time of task makes less, makes less sense than other criteria. Hmm? And so these are criteria that you can use. It's not mandatory that you have subjective matrix prior to the session, after each task, after each group of tasks, at the end, of the, of the study and all quantitative metrics that you can collect. Hmm? And this is again why the planning phase is important, particularly important with respect to the other because you have to decide which of this information you want according to which are your goals for the usability evaluation. What you want to learn, what you want to discover with the usability evaluation. Hmm? So what if error rates makes no sense for you, just don't collect them. Mm? But if it makes sense, well, you can collect them. Maybe it makes sense to collect error rates only on some task and not the others for the nature of the task. This is another option. So there is flexibility here. There is the design part, the planning part, the choice that you make that came in. And to give you a picture, these are metrics mm, that typically are used. Mm. Again, not all metrics for all tasks, for all usability testing, but a, a pot of metrics in which you can surely get some uh, metrics also useful for you. Mm. Uh, some of them, like the successful task completion is something that uh, basically every task has. You, you need a way to decide whether the task was completed or not and successfully completed or not. Errors are another factor that typically came in. It could be critical errors or non-critical errors. And then you can also compute like the free error rate. So rate about errors, etc. Mm -hmm. So let's see them one by one. So successful task completion. It's something, again, it could be a number, it could be a Boolean value. Hmm? Let's say if the single task was successfully completed or not. And again, it could be a Boolean value, like yes, it was completed, or no, wasn't completed, or it could be something on a scale between 0 and 100, for instance, on 0 and 10. Hmm? 
that also say how well the task was completed. Hmm? So with a Boolean value, you say this task was either completed or not. And if there is an error in the task, an error that um, impeded the task to be completed, then you got a uh, no, absolutely not completed. Hmm? Or there are some maybe details that are missing in the task. The task is apparently completed, but not 100% completed. Probably with a Boolean value, you just said no, it's not completed correctly. It was completed, but not correctly. So not successfully completed. Uh, with a scale, you can have a bit more of flexibility on this. You can say, yes, the task was successfully completed 100%, or the task was completed at 90%. It was completed not totally successful, but it's good enough. So you can have a bit more flexibility. Uh, what means that a task is successfully completed? A task is successfully completed when the participants indicate, or you notice, that they have found the answer or completed the task goal. If the task is uh, booking this room, to, to use the same example of the, the last lecture, booking this room on a specific date, on a specific time, once the user, once the participant, book the room, in that specific time, in that specific moment, the task is completed. Book this room in that specific time, in that specific moment. If the user book this room, but not in the specific time or in the specific day, then the task for the participants is completed because it, it actually completed the task. It booked the room in a specific date, in a specific place. And it's up to you, to the criteria you defined before running the task, whether this is something critical and so the user thinks to have completed the, the task, but actually not, because it missed time and date. It was fundamental for you, or instead, so the task wasn't completed. Or instead, you accept that the task is completed, maybe not 100% completed, not with uh, a scale from 0 to 100, not with score 100, but maybe 90 or 80 or 70. And you have to decide that. So this is in the end is for each task, for each participant will be either yes, no, or a numbers. N numbers that can be also put together. And so if you use a scale, you can say task number one was on average completed uh, successfully with score of 85. Mm -hmm. The other task was completed with score of 50. But clearly should be completed, the task. So again, the participants should be able in our example, to book this room in a specific date, in a specific time. Mm? If the participant, instead of booking the room, is booking an exam, mm? then the task is clearly not completed because it's, it's yet another totally different task. Critical errors. Mm? Critical errors, so errors can be split in two, critical and non-critical. Critical errors are errors that um, are critical for completing the target of the task in a way that the participant cannot finish the task. Hmm? So not only the participant maybe booked the exam instead of the room, for instance. So he did another task at a certain point. But the participant wasn't able to complete the booking of the room. He, he wasn't able to, to actually complete the task, either successfully or not successfully. There are big errors that prevent the participant to complete the task. Not only, again, successfully <coughs> or slightly successfully, complete at all in that case. So all these kind of errors are critical errors because it doesn't bring to the completion of that specific task. Again, booking an exam instead of a room is a 
critical error. And not completing, not booking anything because the participant wasn't able at a certain point, the participant say, I don't know how to, to continue. Something like this is another very critical error, clearly. And notice that for critical error, participants may or may not be aware that the task is completed, incorrectly or not. Maybe the user, again, you give the, the participant the task of booking this room today at 11, and a participant book an exam today at 11. And then said to you, okay, I'm done. So the participant think that the task is successfully completed, but clearly it's not. So this is a critical error, and the participant should receive the new task in that case. Hmm? Shouldn't be aware that the task was, was not completed, that the participant completed another task that was the one you asked for. Hmm? So these clearly are critical error for the task. And these are typically absolute or relative number. Hmm? This uh, task has three critical, had three critical error by, by participant number one, or one critical error. Hmm? And again, whether an error is considered critical or not slightly depend on the nature of the task. Hmm? To use the same example again, booking this room today at 11, you can consider this room today at 11, today and at 11 as three separate opportunities for critical errors. So if the user book this room today at noon, it could be a critical error or not. It depends on the goal of your application and your task. If you are more interested in um, booking the room, no matter the day on the play or the time, then probably they are not critical error. But if you are really interested for, because your application is strongly based on time and date, so it's very important that time and date are specified every time and in a correct way, then that could be critical error too. Hmm? Uh, Non-critical errors instead are error that are recovered by the participants and do not result in the ability of successfully complete or not a task. Hmm? So these errors result in the task being completed, but just less efficiently. Hmm? So, same example of before, booking this room today at 11, if the user book this room and then select it today, and then select, I don't know, 11 p.m. instead of 11 in the morning. Hmm? And then, before pressing book, hmm? or after pressing book, it say no. Let me edit that. And so, actually, modified autonomously, notice that the mistake, and not modify that, then that could be a non-critical error because the task was actually completed 100% successfully because the user recovered autonomously from the error. But it's something that you want to take trace. Hmm? Want to trace because <clears throat> they could be also significant for understanding that maybe there is some problem with the time picker. Maybe there is not strong differences between time is in the morning or time in the afternoon, or maybe there is no difference. It always just was a slip of the user that, um, that scrolled too much uh, until 11 p.m. instead of 11 a.m. So it could be a problem in the user interface or just a, a slip that one person just had and all the other participants don't. But it's something that you want to take trade. To, to consider, because if you don't take note of this, and if it's happen again and again and again, you, and you never take notes, you, you are missing a possible problem that can bring also to significant problem at a certain point. Hmm? So just to 
to summarize, critical errors are errors that prevent the task to be successfully completed, and whether the user, the participants know or not. And non-critical errors are instead errors that are recovered autonomously by the participants and that bring to a completion of the task anyway. Hmm? So clearly, this non-critical error may affect the successful task completion in terms of percentage. Hmm? If you use a scale, hmm? see such non-critical error can reduce the scale because the, the task is successfully completed just not 100% because there are, the user makes some errors in, the, in the between, but he was able to successfully complete the task. Critical errors instead prevent the completion of the, of the task, hmm? the successfully completion of the task. With those information, you can also compute, if needed, an error-free rate. So the percentage of participants who complete a specific task without any error. And this is clearly a relative number since it's a percentage. These three, task completion, critical error, and non-critical errors, are metrics that are, let's say, always used in usability testing. Completion task, number of errors that the, that the participant did on the task. The error-free rate could be computed after and is less frequent. Time on task. Time on task, as the name say, is the amount of time that each participant's need had used to complete the task. One minute, 30 seconds, three minutes, participant one. Participant two, for the same task, use a different time. Participant three, double the time, etc. And this is time. <coughs> this metric makes sense when, again, when the task is not time sensitive. Uh, when you want to be sure, especially that that task is not too long or too short. Maybe you say, okay, this should be completed in 30 seconds. And so you want to see how, how long the participants took to complete the task. And it cannot be used when you apply some uh, methodology to the task, like uh, thinking aloud or comparative evaluation that we are going to see in a moment, since they will modify how the user, uh, how the participant do the task. Hmm? So given that they remove some naturalness on the task, time on task cannot be used in that, in those, with those methodology, for instance. And, and we will see them in a moment so it will be clear what is mean, meant. Um, then we have all the subjective measure. Uh, that we mentioned before, so self-reported participant rating for satisfaction, ease of use, ease of finding information, uh, efficacy, usability, etc. And they are typically on a Likert scale, one to five. Mm -hmm. So they are subjective, but they are in a way quantitative. Mm -hmm. Do you have numbers? Mm -hmm. It's not free text. And then especially in, uh, after the, the study, after the test, you can also have some like, dislike, some recommendation for the, by the participants. So what participants like the most about the system? What they like the least? Any recommendation they have about what they experiment? Hmm? And these are free text. They could be written, it could be spoken, but it's free text. So still subjective measure in a way, but in this case, qualitative measurement. And typically all of these at the end of the session or in a specific part of it. Mm -hmm. Typically this is in the, the briefing part of the session that is after the session, before um, greeting the user and greeting the participants and having a new participant come in, you have this 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever, uh, debriefing session with all 
with the participants and the note takers and the facilitator and the observer with everybody in the room just sharing, making questions, sharing ideas, likes, dislikes, etc. A sort of interview, a post-test interview. Notice that exist standard, let's say, reliable and validated hmm, questionnaire for both the subjective measures and some of the open question, like this like, dislikes, and recommendation. Hmm. And clearly these subjective measures, um, and also the, the free text question could be done at the end of the session. Some could be also at the beginning of the session, but again, also after each task or after each group of tasks, some group of tasks. Hmm? Partially depends on the, again, on the nature of the task itself. So these are the metrics that you can collect. Hmm? And then, let me say one more thing. There are metrics uh, that you can collect automatically and other that you can collect manually. Mm? So the number of errors is something that you can, can collect either automatically or manually. It depends on the kind of, of, error, of errors. Mm? So manually means that the observer, the facilitator is there and take notes. Okay, yes, participant one did this error. Participant one did this other error in this task, etc. Or automatically. So again, logging when a participant clicked somewhere in a user interface, so you know that uh, after the click on the button A, you should have the click on button B, but if the participant click on button C or in other place, you, you see from data that you may have an error. Then clearly those data need to be analyzed to, be, to get this information, to get this pattern, but you can also do it for some kind of errors in an automatic way. Uh, and other things that could be done either automatically or manually, but often automatically, is time on task. Mm -hmm. So you can either have a stopwatch and say, okay, start the task and start a stopwatch and then stop, end the task and stop the stopwatch. Um, or you can have your system, your application measuring time automatically so that you can say from timestamp A to timestamp B it's task number one for this participant. Hmm? Clearly for manually taken metrics is just you. Probably a piece of paper and a watch and a pencil to, that take notes of everything. In the automatic way you need to change something in your system in your interactive system to add these new features to keep track and save somewhere in a reliable way all this information. Mm -hmm. So maybe you don't deploy in general a system with a lot of logging for timestamps. Mm -hmm. But if you want to measure time for the study you modify the system for measuring that time as well. Or you can have something in the user interface that say, click here to start the new task. That is not something that you do in the, in, in the real application, but you are modifying, adding a page with just a big button that say, click here to start task number two. And this click here is the moment in which the timer for computing time and task is started. So you are structuring, modifying slightly the application to better support the usability testing for the automatic part of the um, of collection of data. And similarly, you may want to, and this is something that you can also do for your usability testing, you may want to prepare your user, your interface to better support the, the tasks so if you are tasked about booking this room at a specific time in a specific place and you want, I don't know, that there is a conflict 
of time in booking this room, you have to prepare the application in a state in which when the participant will book this room, the conflict will emerge. So the application should already have a booking for this room in it. This is still part of planning and preparing for the usability testing. Putting everything in the, in the context ready for the evaluation. Okay, then we said that you can apply or not, and let me stress this not, method some methodologies, one methodology for two different tasks, if you want, if it makes sense. Um, and we, we are going to present two of the methodology that are the most standard, uh, let's say, used. Uh, one is the think aloud, and the other is the cooperative evaluation. So, which is the idea of the think aloud? So actually is in the name. While a participant perform a specific task, the participant is asked to describe what she is doing and why. What the participant is thinking, etc. So think aloud. Speak and say whatever they are going to do. Hmm? Whatever they are thinking, they have to say what they're thinking. Hmm? This is done for those tasks where you are also interested in understanding the process that the participant is having behind the scene. Hmm? How the participant move from one point to the other, why the participant click in a place in another place, where the participant is looking for information on the page before making a decision. So to, to make, make explicit everything that is implicit in the head of the participant. So the participant in, with this methodology is invited and the facilitator should invite the participant to use this methodology to think loud, so to, do, to, to speak about everything that he's doing. Okay, so I'm, now I'm reading this button here, and I'm looking for this information, and I don't find this information on the top of the page, or it's here in the bottom. So I can click on the button in the bottom of the page. And now it's open this pop-up. It's unexpected that this pop-up opens. I, I don't understand why it opens the pop-up. I was expecting something different. So just all the reasoning, explicit, make explicit all the reasoning, speaking what happens. So clearly, you now understand why this task with this methodology cannot have a time on task, a reliable time on task. Because if the participant is speaking and making all the reasoning vocally, you, you don't have a reliable time for the task because this time will be longer. Because participant is speaking and giving comments and etc. So it, times will be diluted mm, with respect to the participant doing the task, just in the case. Mm. So which are the advantages for this? Well, first of all, it's simple. Mm. Just the participant just needs to speak and say what he's going to do before doing it, and which are the reasoning behind the choices and the things that they are doing. Another advantage is that can provide useful insight. So if all participants say, oh, I was, wasn't expected to, to see this pop-up, or this model window, or this information appearing this way, maybe they complete the task successfully. But that could be a sign that something could be improved, like these windows that is popping up at a certain point. So it can provide useful insight for you, and can also show how the system is actually used where people looked, uh, before clicking, which reasoning they are making, etc. There are clearly also disadvantages. It's highly subjective, hmm? because it's how a single person think about a single task. Hmm? And so it's subjective and selective in that, w in that case, because it's just about one task at a time. It's not about the entire system. It's not the cognitive walkthrough that go through 
all the application, just for one task at a time. And again, the act of describing, hmm, the act of thinking aloud, alter some performance, some measurement on the task, like the time on task. Hmm, because you are adding more time because the person is speaking. Hmm. So this is a methodology that, again, makes sense for some tasks. It's uh, really, really difficult to see or an entire usability testing done with all tasks with this methodology. So for some tasks, it makes sense. For other tasks, it makes sense not to have that. Hmm? It makes sense for the task that you are particularly interested in understanding the process behind in the mind of the user. Hmm? Uh, the other methodology is called cooperative evaluation and it's actually a variation of the think aloud. Mm? So the idea is always the same. The participant think aloud about what he's doing. Uh, the difference here is that it's cooperative. So it's not the participant that speaks alone and the facilitator, the note takers are still there taking notes and silent and watching the participant completing the task, just listening. But here, the participant and the facilitator cooperate, speak each other. Mm? So the facilitator can ask questions to the participants and the participant can ask questions to the facilitator. So why this is done this way? Mm? I don't find this information is there or not. So they are speaking, they are cooperate toward the successful of the task. Mm? without the facilitator telling how to complete the task, but speaking, reasoning together with the participant, like a, a buddy. Uh, advantages. It's a slightly easier to use than think aloud, because the facilitator can help the user to reason better about things. Uh, the user is more encouraged to criticize the system because the facilitator is there criticizing the system as well. So they are both trying to reason about the crit critique about the system. And clarification is possible because the facilitator is there and can clarify some aspects if, uh, if they are unclear. When think aloud, they, they cannot. And clearly, the same disadvantage of think aloud are maintained. It's still subjective and, uh, and surely it alters task performance. In some cases, much more than the think aloud because here you have two people speaking, not just one. Mm? So for sure the task performance, if you are really interested in the time of a single task, you cannot use neither of those because you are altering significantly the time because you have been people chatting during the execution of the task. And another, uh, if you want, the disadvantages of this is that the facilitator should be really careful in what she is saying. Because the facilitator cannot tell the participant how to complete the task, for instance. Otherwise, the, the task will end and the methodology will end and it's done. So it should provide clarification, should provide information, it should answer to question, but not describe the next step hmm, to complete the task. Otherwise, all the metrics, all the information you want to get are, are, da are gone, hmm, because it's the facilitator that is actually completing the task, not the participant. So these are the two methodologies. So each task could have either one of these two methodology or no methodology at all. And consequently, each task will have those metric, some of those metric, for sure the successfully completion rate and the error uh, measurements. And for all of these, you need probably some equipment. And not only an equipment in terms of rooms, but also 
materials. So in terms of rooms and space, all of these are demonstrated to work effectively for conducting uh, usability testing. You can have laboratory, the usability testing labs that we have seen before, so two or three connected room with uh, glasses and audiovisual equipment fixed in a place, very, key, very well kept room. And you can have on the opposite a Zoom call or something like that, so remotely, hmm, with the participants in, on the other place hmm, in, a, in a different location, either moderated or not moderated, either video, reco video recording or not video recording, etc. Hmm. This is uh, all the range, so you can have the best kit uh, room or you can do it remotely. Hmm. Uh, and in the middle, a room with portable recording equipment and a room with no recording equipment, but you really have to have skilled uh, observator and uh, facilitator that take notes, take a lot of notes, a lot of notes. Hmm? So usability testing are typically video and or audio recorded um, for further analysis on the videos hmm, so that you can see after the evaluation, uh, if you miss something, hmm, you can rewatch some particular task that maybe all the participants made a lot of mistake in the task, so you can rewatch that portion of the video for all participants together and see if there are some similarities, see if there are some common issues that emerge that you didn't notice because you have had the 10, let's say the five, participant the feasibility testing in two weeks. So you don't really remember what happens in the first uh, task when you are in the last one mm, or after the last one. So they are typically recorded for, especially for further analysis and for confirming some notes mm, that the participant, the, the observator are, are taking. Mm. Uh, they are typically screen recorded if it's a graphic user interface and video recorded. So it's recorded the participants and it's also recorded the screen. And also audio could be. If you have think aloud uh, task, you can clearly record audio so that you can re-listen the entire description of the task for all participants together. And then you can have, again, equipment, mm, material, mm, starting from the uh, easy one, paper and pencil, mm, for taking notes. That is fundamental note-taking. Uh, audio for thinking aloud, video that is accurate and realistic because you can record whatever it happens, not only the screen, but also the face of the participant. Mm. Uh, where is looking, if it's annoyed, bored or not. So you can also have all these other kind of information if you're interested, but video recording, people recording, needs clearly sp special equipment, needs a camera, probably not the camera of the computer, and maybe obtrusive. Hmm? If you are here working on a computer and then you have a, a camera just in the back of the computer looking at you recording with a uh, red light all the time for 15 minutes, then it can be obtrusive and you can also be less natural because you know that you are recorded. So it could be useful for having more accurate and realistic data, but it can introduce other kind of issue, bias, uh, not, not totally natural um, behavior. Maybe the participant will not say something because he think that is not, uh, that maybe it's a little bit rude because it's video recorded but instead, if it's not video recorded, it will be more free to speak. So it's, it's challenging, video is always challenging, not only for these reasons, also for privacy reasons. Clearly, if you record a person in face for 15 minutes, you have to get a lot of privacy-related measure pre prerequisite, satisfy a lot of prerequisite, like where this data is going to be stored how, af how long after will be deleted, et cetera. Mm. Uh, then you can have computer logging. 
Mm? We, we said before, for instance, for computing the data. Mm? So this is automatic, this is unobtrusive for the user. It's much work, it's more work for you, for the implementer, for the designer, because it may need to edit the application to add this automatic logging. And if you get too much data, they could be difficult then to analyze mm? if you are logging too much. But it's another reliable way to getting some measurement and information. And in some cases, you can also have eye tracking. Mm? If you're interested in understanding where the user is, where the participant is looking on the screen, mm? it's another source of information. It's not a major that you can have. Where the user is looking, so maybe to match with the thing cloud, or also without the thing cloud, they give you an idea where, the, which are the traces of the user, where the user, where the participant is looking at in the first place, and then where the sites move around the application before doing or not doing a certain action. In practice, all of these, hmm, paper, pencil, paper, audio, video, computer logging, and uh, tracking have a mixed used. So they are not used all together, but in some cases there are more of this set and the other. So there is a mix of these. So in some cases, um, computer logging or other kind of automatic support tool are available and used. For sure, paper and pencil is present. Eye tracking needs to have a, a laboratory, a keep laboratory, because Clearly, you cannot do it remotely. Uh, audio, video have this issue that we, we mentioned. Sometimes screen recording is good enough hmm? because you see what the user is, is doing without, without having to record the entire environment. In other cases, you are interested in video recording. It depends also on the application. Hmm? Um, Especially if it's just software and a graphic user interface, in most of the cases, screen recording is good enough. If it, there is an application that has maybe other parts, other hardware parts to be used, then you, you cannot rely only on screen recording. Mm -hmm. uh, audio video transcription is surely difficult and requires skill. If you record, so let's imagine that each each usability testing will last half an hour. If you have five people, it's two, two hours and the half of video recording. So if you want to analyze that, you have to rewatch two hours and a half of video recording, not double the speed like many of you or your colleague do with video lectures, but slowly taking notes, understanding what is happening carefully to get information. So it's incredibly time consuming. Also, if you need to transcribe, to, to write down whatever they said, you, you have time, you, you, or you are very, very quick in writing, or you need to have time listening, pausing the video, writing, completing the writing, restarting the video, etc. So it's very time, time consuming. And after you have this transcription of two hour and a half of a conversation of different people, you also have to put them together hmm? to, to extract a common team, to extract common areas of interest, to extract more significant and less significant issues that emerge. Hmm? So this is actually difficult and requires skills and is time consuming. Hmm? There are some kind of automatic support for transcribing text, especially in tools like you know, Zoom or the others, but still they suffer of some issues and they cannot be used everywhere in any context. Hmm? So some of this material, you are going also to use some of this material, surely paper and pencil, maybe some kind of video recording, screen recording, or some kind of computer logging. Again, depending on your usability testing and your application. Then, we said that after each task, we can have, or better, we can have among the subjective measure, questionnaire. And I told you that there exists what they call the standard questionnaire, and the one that the slides said um, 
reliable and validated questionnaire. So here we are going to present three, I think, questionnaire. One is a post-task questionnaire. So a questionnaire that is done after a single task. <coughs> so the participants, the participant will receive a task, complete the task, or receive a questionnaire. Then another task, another questionnaire. Another task, another questionnaire. Hmm? <coughs> and this questionnaire, so in general, the characteristics of this post-task questionnaire is that they need to be short because you are going to repeat it maybe 10 times in addition to everything else. So they cannot be 11 questions to answer carefully with free text form for each task. Otherwise you will have very angry participants in the end. So indeed this post-task questionnaire is called single is question. As the name say, is just one question single and easy. Hmm? So it's a question to say overall, so that is, that is in the picture, is the entire question. One question to say overall, this task was on a scale between one and seven, when one, where one is very difficult and seven is very easy. So a Likert scale. You, you have a task, you have a post questionnaire task to say, was it easy or not? What is very difficult, one, what is very easy, seven, or something in the middle. Hmm? So quick and ease and a single question. Hmm? This is, and you have to, to trust, um, to trust us, this, is, this was experimentally validated and reliable, valid as a measurement. Hmm? So it's not, was, was ex there was experiments on assessing whether this is really accurate or not. Hmm? Or after, you know, the participant received this questionnaire 10 times, just starting putting cross on random numbers just to complete the session and do other things in the day. Clearly, this make the session longer because after each task, you have to give this questionnaire. So they exist. There are not a lot of post-task questionnaire uh, in standard, let's say, validated. This is one of the very few questionnaire that we have. And they are, I would say, in general, not so frequently used because it's after each task, it's, it, it's tend to be really um, interfering with the, the entire study. What is used more, so basically all, almost all disability testing study have post-test questionnaire. Hmm? So at the end of the test, maybe before doing the the briefing session, hmm? you give your participant one at a time, clearly after their study, a questionnaire. So just one per session, at the end of the session. And this questionnaire could be created by you, or you can use some, again, reliable and validated experimentally questionnaire. Hmm? And we're going to see two of them. Uh, one is very easy to use, that is this one, the system usability scale, and the other one is particular as more difficult to use. And then you can also create your own questionnaire, asking your own question. They are clearly not, real, not validated, but if you are interested in some questions specifically, you can also create your own questionnaire. So this is one of the two post-test -quest, post questionnaires that we are going to present. There are quite a much more post-validated post-test questionnaire than post-task questionnaire in general. Um, this is a, a questionnaire that is general. 
and for which exist variation for covering specific applications. So this is the general one, quite old. It was invented in 1986. Quite old, but also quite validated in practice, because it's since 1986 that people use it, both in universities and in, in industries, in companies. So it's surely validated and reliable, and still used a lot. And this questionnaire is called System Usability Scale. General, system, whatever it is a system. And the definition, the, the, the creator, this John Brook, said that this is a quick and dirt, but trustable usability scale. Where the quick and dirt is to keep in mind, also considering what we said last time about usability testing. Usability testing is more informal. It's giving the application to a bunch of people and say, try them, and I will try to get errors Usability issues, things that work well or not. Mm? It's not systematic, it's not scientific on that perspective. Mm? So this is quick and dirt. Usability scale. And it measure, and this is another fundamental point, it measure the perceived usability. So the usability as the participant is perceiving it in a subjective manner. Mm? You cannot say with this questionnaire the usability is objectively this. Because this is just the perceived usability of those participants. Still validated, reliable, trustable, but measure that, not measure other things. It's a questionnaire made of 10 questions. Each of them with five possible answers on a Likert scale, from one to five, where one is strongly disagree, and five is I strongly agree with the, the statement made in the question. And for all of them, this is the, the classification, and which is actually good, maintaining consistency also in designing questionnaire. There is a statement and say one, I strongly disagree, five, I strongly agree, and in the middle, two will be I probably a weak disagree, I disagree, four, I agree, and three, I, I'm not sure. I neither agree or disagree with this statement. It produces a score from zero to 100. So in the end, you can say, the results from a questionnaire is 85. Hmm? But again, notice that this is not a percentage. It's just a number from zero to 100. You cannot say it is 85%. It's percent of nothing. It's just 85. Hmm? And a system that receive a system usability scale score above 68 is considered above average. So if your system has 85 as a result, it has a very good perceived usability. So you are more than on the right way. 68 is where you have the, the threshold. If it's lower than 68, you have troubles. If it's more than 68, you are above average for the perceived usability. Hmm? So it gives you a value to consider. Hmm? And which are these 10 questions? So this is a standard questionnaire. If you look on, on the internet system usability scale questionnaire, you can download it, PDF. Hmm? It's well explained, it's, it's since again, 1986 that this is exists and is used. Hmm? Um, but these are the 10 questions for which each participant will have to answer one, I strongly disagree with them, up to five, I strongly agree with this. I think I would like to use the system frequently. So frequency use of the system after in the real life. I found the system unnecessarily complex. 
I thought the system was easy to use, so complexity, easiness to use. I think that it would need the support of a technical person to be able to use the system. I strongly agree, I strongly disagree. I found the various function in the system were well integrated one in other. So I don't have two systems in one, but all the functions are well integrated. I thought that there, were, there was too much inconsistency in this system overall. I would imagine that most people would learn to use this system very quickly. I found the system very cumbersome to use. I felt very confident using the system and I needed to learn a lot before I could get going with the system. So these are the 10 questions that you don't have to, to remember. They are again standard and freely down, downloadable from, from everywhere basically. Uh, but we can notice one thing in this question. What we can notice on this overall in this question? Nothing, they are good. They're all very subjective. Clearly they are subjective since the questionnaire measured perceived usability. So it's it's by design. One is good, one is bad. One is positive, it's always the same pattern. The first is positive. The second is negative. The third is positive. The fourth is negative. And this applies to all 10. There is always a positive question and a negative question. So if you say, I strongly agree with the first one, you are supporting something that is positive. If you say, I strongly agree with the second one, you are you're strongly agreed with something that is negative for your system. Hmm? So this was done, again, by design for two reasons. The first one is how this, or better, I don't know in which order, but one of the reason is that how the score of the questionnaire is calculated. So they are needed for calculating the question, the calculating the result, that score from zero to 100. The other reason is to keep the participant aware. So the participant needs to read and reflect. He cannot just answer five to all the questions randomly. If it do does that, it will probably create a 50-50 situation. So if the participant is not really doing the questionnaire well, is not saying, I will go all the positive scores because I, I'm trusting everything you wrote. So I'm giving five, the best mark possible to all the questions because they are not. They are giving actually half of the question very well saying that the, quest, the, sar, the, the, sar, the system is functioning for 50% very well and for the other 50% of the question very bad. Hmm? So the, the, the participant needs to really uh, read and choose. So uh, a perfect system, we will have five on the positive question and one on the negative ones. Hmm? So the participant needs at least to, to understand this trick and then before doing it automatically if they don't want, but re they really need to, to read and reflect on every single question. So do it very carefully. So if you see all ones or all five, probably the, the participant is, wasn't reading, was just checking five and one randomly. So probably that questionnaire is to be thrown away. So how you calculate this number between zero and 100. Hmm? So, so each answer is one to five. Hmm? So you have a number, one to five. That it's called X in the slide. Hmm? For every odd number question, you have to subtract one from the score. Hmm? So for question number one, three, five, etc., if you get four, 
Hmm? This score is 3, 4 minus 1. For the even number question, you subtract the score from 5. Hmm? So for answer number 2, again, if the answer for question 2 is 4, the score is 5 minus 4. That is 1. This is to balance the positive and the negative answer. Then for, this is done for each participant. So questionnaire number one of participant number, so questionnaire of participant number one, you pick every question and you say, okay, this is one, four, get the score minus one. This is question number two, so five minus the, the value. Question number three, the value minus one, etc. And you then perform an addition of these results. So let's say three plus one plus whatever for all the 10 questions. And then you multiply the results by 2.5. And this magically give you a number between zero and 100 that is validated hmm, about the perceived usability. Hmm? And you do this for each participant. So if you have five participants, you will have five scores. And then you can, for instance, do an average of these five scores to get the overall score of your system. Hmm? And again, if you get 68 or more, you, you know that the perceived usability on a subjective matter is quite good. Otherwise, it's not. Hmm? And the rest of the study, the rest of the usability text is there for helping you understand which are the problems to be fixed, to increase possibly that, that score. Hmm? Advantages and disadvantages. Hmm? Well, advantages is free, is quick, and it's simple. You just have to perform some subtraction, one addition, and a multiplication. And there are 10 questions, one five. It's easy for you, it's easy for the participant is re very reliable hmm? over the decades since 1986 has been validated. So it is really, really reliable. Uh, it is also demonstrated to be on par with more complex method to, to calculate the usability. Hmm? So quite a lot of advantage. It's quite used in the industry as a questionnaire after usability testing. And it's general, so it's applicable to a wide range of systems. Could be vocal user interface, uh, graphical user interface, artificial intelligence system, because it's, it's subjective and quite general. Mm -hmm. Then I was saying that exists variation of this for specific application domain, but this is still the change some question, maybe according to the specifics of the system, but this is still generic. These advantages, it's subjective. It's a subjective measure of perceived usability. So it cannot be your only methods. You cannot do an usability test which only the result is this one. Because it gives you no information. It gives you, oh yes, you are doing quite well. Okay, in what I'm doing well? What I'm doing bad? No idea. Also it's subjective and, and it's about the perceived usability. That can or cannot be matched with the real usability of the system. Hmm? So it's quick and dirt as a scale. Just remember the definition of the author. Hmm? So it should be your only methods and it give no clue about how to improve the score. You got 70, how can you move to 100? You don't know. This questionnaire doesn't tell you anything about this. So it's not diagnostic. You need to leverage on all the other things that you did in the test to understand how you can possibly modify and, and possibly improve the score. And another disadvantage that is more a characteristic is not possible to make comparison between systems, different systems using SUS. So if you have one application here that got a SUS, a SUS score of 70, and another application there that make a SU score of 75, you cannot say my application is better than yours. You cannot. 
Even if numbers, even if you have numbers, 70 or 75, 75 is bigger than 70, you cannot by design of this survey, this, this questionnaire. You cannot make comparison between SAS, SAS score. You can say my system is above average and the other group can say my system is above average. I get 75, I get 70, but any comparison is meaningless. Hmm? So this is another advantage. You cannot use it saying this, I have one, two version of application, one get a SAS score of 70 and the other one get a SAS score of 75, so version two is better. You cannot say this. You can say both versions are, are, are above average. That's the only thing that you can say. Another questionnaire that is way more difficult to use and to especially calculate is the NASA TLX. So this is called the NASA Task Load Index because it was developed and created by the Aerospace Agency in the US. In the 80, the 1980, for, this is not general about usability, this is for measuring in a specific and reliable way the perceived workload of people using a system. Mainly the cognitive workload workload of using a system. So it's not about how easy it is to use or how enjoyable or if you, you will use the system again, but is I want to understand how much stress the system is putting on you. How much workload is putting on you. How much cognitive efforts the system is putting on you. So you can imagine why it was born there, because they have highly technical task on aerospace vehicle. So people in the aerospace, in an airplane or in a shuttle, had to do very high specific task, and they are cognitive demanding, and how they do that from a user interface perspective could also impact the results of this task that could bring, uh, and if you, you, you could make these complex tasks wrongly, you can kill people, or you can waste thousands of millions of dollars, hmm? and we just, you can ease that maybe with a better user interface. Hmm? So this was born there, but still used for studying complex product and task hmm, in environments that have high consequence, like space, military, healthcare, hmm, where people's life is at stake, and tasks are complex, not simple. Hmm. But again, it's for the workload, hmm, the cognitive efforts, the efforts a person is doing for completing a specific task with a specific system. Hmm. So you see, it speaks about uh, mental demand, physical demand, temporal demand, performance, effort, frustration, hmm? so all things that have to do with your cognitive, your workload, or using a system. Hmm? So if you are, don't have frustration, if the effort is low, is the performance high, is the cognitive demand is not too high, probably you make less error and the system is easier to use overall, even if it's a complex operation. Hmm? So these are six questions on an unlabeled 21-point scale, hmm? ranging from very low to very high, but 21 checks. Hmm? And each question addresses one dimension of the perceived workload, mental, physical, time pressure, perceived success, overall effort, and frustration. Hmm? And Participants that need to complete this uh, weight each one of the questions in the six categories to indicate also which matter the most to what they are doing. So if it's a system that, is, that requires no physical demands but high mental demands, they, they also notice that. 
notice that this system is requiring very physical demands because maybe I have just to, to flip a coin or to, to move, but to press a button. But the mental demand is very, very high. Or vice versa, it's also something that is very physically demanding, also in addition to mental. So again, for workload, not only for aerospace, but for, if you are interested in understanding the workload that the person is, is having on a system, this is a very good questionnaire. But it's also complex to score. So it's not a matter of uh, sub subtraction and addition and then multiply for 2.5, uh, but there is uh, an entire system, quite complex, to calculate the score in the end, a number in the end that give you the perceived workload. Hmm? So there is a paper and pencil, if you're curious, you can go here. There is a paper and pencil version how to compute the score once you collect the questionnaire, and there is also uh, an iOS application to, to compute the score. Hmm? A sort of officially, official application to compute the score. Hmm? Because it's, it's, a really, it's really complex how to do that. So we are not going to see how to compute the, the score clearly since it's really complex. So in, let's say, every day, so most of the usability testing uh, either use the SUS questionnaire or similar questionnaire or handcrafted questionnaire. This kind of questionnaire is used specifically for understanding the workload. So if you are really interested in the workload of your system, this is the great questionnaire. Not easy to compile and to analyze, but it's really, really reliable and well done. Um, then I put here some links about the scripts, how scripts can ap appear. So the scripts is what the facilitator is going to say line by line, word by word. And so here there are some example and also uh, some indication by the same Nielsen uh, and Norman as before on how to create a good task. We are going to have next week uh, exercise in which we start to creating, to planning a usability study. So we are going to create a portion of the script, we are going to create a table of the task with subset criteria, matrix, etc., and also to define which, which could be a good task for a fictionary um, application. So we are going to have some, some example, given that there are this variability and flexibility in this kind of things and, and that every, every application can have different set of tasks, we are going to do a, an example hmm, that should help also you to better understand all these things that we have seen in a more general way. Uh, running, so the planning is the most critical part. Running and analyzing is slightly easier if you plan everything well. How do you run the, plan, the test? Very easy. First of all, get the participant. Schedule the time with the participant. Get the participant in the room, in the call, whatever. Get the, greet the participant, be kind. Get the informed consent in a written format so that you can collect. Hmm? Then one person acts as a facilitator and the other are observer and you, have, you must have at least one observer. Tell each participant, and this is important, we are testing our application system, not you. Any mistakes are the app fault, not yours. This is fundamental hmm? to set the stage and say every error is not your fault, it's the application fault. Don't worry. The facilitator then should always follow the script Remain neutral, not helping the participant, and provide clear instruction. Possibly following, reading from the script, hmm, what to say. And when needed, the facilitator is the one that encourages the participant to adapt, to adopt a methodology. So for this task, you have to use Think Aloud. Think Aloud is, so it's, it's due by the facilitator. Note takers and observer are silent, members of the, of the team at that moment, they only take notes or whatever that happens. Hmm? The behavior of participant, comments, error, 
completion of task, something that the node is happening, etc. And for running it, you clearly have a system, an application that is must be ready to measure all the defined the defined criteria, not only automatically, but also the note takers and facilitators should be ready to keep track of everything that you want to keep track of. So maybe they have some uh, schema on a piece of paper they can easily uh, check to, to not to forget anything. And then you need to analyze. You did this for five times, you get a bunch of data and you have to analyze. To find the usability problem, to find user interface failures and way to improve your application, your process, your task. Starting from all the things that we, you plan for, the written notes, the audio, the questionnaire, videos, usage log, etc., screen recording, etc. All the things that you planned for before. Um, the metrics could be considered per task and overall, we said. You can have error rate per task and error rate for the entire um, study. Uh, quantitative data can be summarized. Success rate, task time, error rates, the rating for uh, system usability scale, questionnaire, etc. And you also should look for trends and keep account of problem that happened across participants. Hmm? So this is something for which not take our observer are fundamental. Maybe participant number one, three, five, seven, eight, and nine had the same problem. And you don't see that problem only analyzing the single results, but on the overall, the bigger picture, you see that this problem was repeated for more than half of your participants, for instance. So you can observe that, you can get additional comments on those specific questions also with other participants, and you can also have answer to the open-ended question. So this is basically analyzing and getting results from everything that you collected that you planned for. Okay? As I was saying, this close this usability testing Next lecture, we will do this exercise, which we will try to start at least, one hour in the half is not enough to complete, but start the planning. We will pick one user interface that you will all know, or mostly know, that is not something related to Polytechnico, I promise. But, uh, and we will try to understand which task we could, we could do for checking, testing the usability of the system, okay? So, have a good day and see you in the lab in a while.